So um, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the assistance of my colleague and friend Danny Leroy on uh, the work that we've been doing on biofuels in the last several years. Uh, we have published several papers on this and we, I've called it again a biofuels frenzy because I think that's actually what has been happening. And um, um, as we go through here, I think you will see that this has quite enormous implications for food security and agriculture and agricultural incomes uh, in Canada and really around the world. Um, the production of biofuel from agricultural and forestry sources has been a focus of attention for quite a few years, particularly after the energy crisis of the 1970s. <clears throat> Most of what we've seen so far is what has been called first generation biofuels, which are ethanol from cereal grains and sugar, producing ethanol from sugar in Brazil mainly, um, biogas from anaerobic digestion of organic materials like manure or food wastes and so on, and biodiesel from oil seeds. The rapid increase in biofuel production has been strongly correlated with the rapid increase in the price of oil, which has risen from just over $20 per barrel 10 years ago to as almost $150 during the summer of 2008, and now is, uh, I think it's $93 a barrel today. Now the biofuels industry has been um, assisted a lot by government uh, uh, programs and the principal reasons for promoting the biofuels industry through government policies are first to lower greenhouse gas emissions, secondly to enhance and stabilize farm incomes through uh, 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 introduction of new markets for farm commodities, thirdly to promote rural development and economic diversification, and fourthly to assist with energy security by making the domestic economy less reliant on imported fossil fuels as we put in that um, terror-free oil uh, filling station in the United States. Canada, of course, is a large net exporter of all kinds of energy, like oil, natural gas, coal, uranium, hydroelectric, uh, hydroelectric uh, uh, power, primarily to the United States. So energy security is really not much of an issue for Canada, but it's a big issue for the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. Now biodiesel production in the world has increased from less than 1 billion liters in 2000 to 15 billion liters in 2009, and um, actually it's over 20 billion liters in 2011. I tried to get Danny to fix this graph, but he didn't. <laughs> but actually it's over 20 billion now, so it's way up from even from 2009. Most of the biodiesel uh, production occurs in European countries. The ethanol industry uh, shows a similar picture of growth. Uh, in 2000, total world production of ethanol for fuel was less than 20 billion liters. Uh, by 2010, production had increased by more than four times to about 85 billion liters. Um, this provides a little more than 5% of the motor gasoline usage in the world. The United States is now the largest producer of ethanol in the world, having overtaken Brazil uh, ha having overtaken Brazil about six years ago, ethanol production in the United States and Brazil exceeds production from all other countries combined. Canada's production is 3.3% of the amount produced in the United States. Now I want to look a little more closely at what happened in Canada. Ethanol production grew very slowly, rising from only 60 million liters in 1995 to about a quarter of a billion liters in 2004, which at that time was less than 2% of the ethanol production in the United States. After a lot of lobbying, the Canadian government announced a mandate for biofuel content in gasoline, diesel, and heating fuels in July 2006. And that mandate said that by 2010, all gasoline in Canada was to contain 5% or more ethanol, while all biodiesel and heating fuels were to contain 2% biodiesel by 2012. According to the government ministers of the day, Rona Ambrose, who is Minister of the Environment, and Chuck Straw, Minister of Agriculture, this would create a market for 3 billion liters of biofuel in Canada, which would require about 8 million tons of grains and oil seeds annually. The mandate was advertised widely. Here you get a look at the Environment Canada webpage, <coughs> which said that the Government of Canada is committed to the development and impl implementation of a Made in Canada plan for reducing greenhouse gases, 
see a major reason, <clears throat> and ensuring clean air, water, land, and energy for Canadians. The Made in Canada approach will be effective, realistic, and focus on achieving sustained reductions in emissions in Canada while ensuring a strong economy. The president of the Canadian Renewable Fuels Association at the time was enthusiastic. He said, today we are releasing a realistic roadmap to create a Made in Canada renewable fuels industry. He went on to say, every portion of the biofuels value chain has participated in this policy process, including farmers, agribusiness, fuel producers, and consumers. There was a surge of support uh, for expansion of the biofuels industry. Take a look at an editorial that appeared in a Florida newspaper in 2007. It said, it takes a creative mind to see the development of gasohol, which is a mixture of gasoline and, and alcohol, as a bad thing. The editors severely criticized two University of Minnesota economists, they didn't name them, but I'm pretty sure I know who they are, <coughs> who had said that ethanol production will divert large amounts of corn from the dinner plate to gas tanks. Corn prices will soar, creating a shortage. In response to these concerns, the editorial stated bluntly, that's nonsense. <clears throat> then there was an editorial in the Calgary Herald that appeared almost the same time. It said an announcement from Dominion Energy that it intends to build an ethanol production plant near Innisfail, Alberta. That is as positive a move as the inclusion of ethanol in the energy mix. Went on to say cutting gasoline with as much as 10% ethanol, grain alcohol, will make engines run cleaner and could help reduce greenhouse emissions. And this homegrown resource will also, in small measure, help reduce dependence on foreign fuels and become a handy addition to income for the cash-strapped prairie farmers who grow the corn, barley, or wheat from which it is delivered. So there you see, they're talking about, they're promoting the, the biofuels industry as, first of all, reducing greenhouse gases, increasing farm incomes, uh, promoting uh, rural development, and also promoting energy security. In fact, governments in 40, 41 separate countries uh, greatly assisted the establishment and expansion of the biofuels industry with a long list of measures. For those of you who think that governments ought not to be meddling in industry and picking winners and that sort of thing, take a look at the measures that have been used to assist the Canadian biofuels industry. I won't read all of these because there's a long list, but you can see National Biomass Ethanol Program, $140 million. Ethanol Expansion Program, $100 million. Some import taxes. Uh, eco Energy, $1.5 billion, $200 million, $20 million, $520 million, $500 million. Excise tax reductions, carbon tax exemptions, uh, such a long list. Accelerated depreciation. In Alberta, Bioenergy Program, Bioenergy Infrastructure Program, Bioindustrial Loan Program. It goes on and on. I don't have them all listed here. Saskatchewan Biofuels Investment Opportunity. And it keeps going. And this is all government money from taxpayers of, going, of course, going to this industry. Another $145 million, a $500 million, and, oh, uh, just wait. Uh, there's more. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, the software for, uh, for PowerPoint would not permit me to put all the measures uh, used by Canadian federal provincial governments onto a single slide. So it's just an enormous amount of programs that have been developed to assist the biofuels industry. Um, the Global Subsidies Initiative, which is a Geneva-based program for, international, for the Inst International Institute for Sustainable Development, has produced a series of country studies in which they have carefully estimated the total costs of support for the biofuels industry. In their study of Canada, they found total transfers from federal and provincial governments during a three-year period, 2006 to 8, to be about 300 million a year. There's a lot of figures here for different programs, but if you look down here, uh, in the order of about 300 million dollars per year, uh, was transferred from taxpayers to, uh, to the industry in various forms. Uh, the transfers actually got greater after 2008. Um, their analysis showed that government assistance in Canada um, accounted for about 20 to 70 percent of the retail prices of the biofuels. Were Canada's policies and expenditures successful? Well, today ethanol production in Canada is about 1.8 billion liters, 
which is seven and a half times what was produced in 2004, but still is only about 60% of their target that the government set in 2006 of three billion liters. Uh, and Canada now produces about 3.3% of what is produced in the United States. Um, and there's only a very small amount of biodiesel that is being produced yet today. So here's a list of the existing and projected ethanol plants in Canada. It's quite a short list, and most uh, uh, have very small production capacities. There's only one plant there, the third one from the top, has 400 million liters per year capacity. Uh, uh, it's in Sarnia, Ontario. Uh, 400 million liters is, is kind of on the small side now for plants being built in the United States. It's where economies of scale really start to kick in. Um, and you see most of Canada's plants are much smaller than that in the order of 100 to 200 million liters per year and quite a few towards the bottom are you know, 25 or 36 or 12. I mean, tremendously high unit costs of production. In the east, the east uh, we use corn as the feedstock in Ontario and Quebec, and in west, it's wheat. There's only one plant operating in Alberta today, and it's the one at uh, Red Deer, the Permalex. It's quite an old plant, quite small plant. There are several that have been proposed, and you can see a couple at the bottom that are, uh, you can see asterisks beside them, which means they're under construction. Maybe they will be completed. Um, but generally, uh, They've had a, a, even with all this enormous government assistance, it has been difficult to stimulate the production of, of ethanol. Biodiesel, even more so. Uh, there's only a, there are a number of plants. This is the the last list I could find. This is about a year ago, a little well, it's a year and a half ago. Uh, you can see the proposed plants with the blue arrow in the top right. Um, the ones that are actually operating, many of them are just tiny, five million liters, one million liters, um, five million. Uh, the 50 million and 66 million are under construction, but one million. A lot of these are just uh, demonstration plants. Um, I mentioned being in Saskatoon, the, the city buses run on biodiesel. It's, the feedstock is uh, cooking oils that they collect from uh, McDonald's and, and uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken and so on. So, bus pulls up to you on a street in Saskatoon, it smells like they got french fries aboard. Um, there's, a, there's a plant being built in, in Lethbridge right now, number 13, Kyoto Fuels. Uh, Kelly Pronovo, some of you know him. Um, it's, under, it's under construction now, we hope that it gets going. But you see, even if it does get going, it's you know, relatively small capacity in terms of world scale. Uh, so right now there isn't a lot of biodiesel in Canada. Now I'd like to raise the issue, not answer it, of the connection between biofuel production and food security. The rapid expansion of biofuel production has corresponded with a dramatic drawdown in stocks of grains and oilseeds around the world. The total harvest of grains in the world in 2011 was only 15 million tons more than consumption. Um, in seven out of the last 12 years, world grain production has been lower than consumption. Production has been lower than consumption seven out of the last 12 years. So the world carryover stocks of all grains in the world today represents only about 75 days of consumption. Here you can see how world grain stocks have fallen since 2000. We like to keep 80 to 100 or more days uh, in stock. Uh, it fell to as low as 63 days in 2007 and 8, and that's why we had the big spike in food prices. Now it's fallen again below 80 to about 75 days, and, and again we're getting the big spikes in food prices. And the reason for that is when stocks get low, uh, prices become very volatile. For example, if, you have, uh, if a company has a contract to supply flour to, say, Safeway, you know, so many tons every, every month, uh, they've got a contract to supply some in April, some in May, some in June. They take a look at the world's at the stock situation and they get nervous. You know, there's no, no more harvest here till next September or October. Where are they going to get the wheat? So they start bidding for it to make sure that they can fulfill their contracts. So whenever you get low stocks, prices tend to spikes, spike and that's what we're seeing again now. Uh, 
we had, uh, in 2009, we had uh, poor crops in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in two 2012, uh, a huge uh, drought in, in the Midwest of the United States, great area, and also in eastern Canada. And so that's one of the reasons why the stock levels are down so much again. Um, so this is creating some sort of a moral dilemma. Do we want to produce crops to feed people or to produce fuel that powers our vehicles? It's one thing when crop failures in key, produce, key grain producing areas lead to food shortages and hunger. It's quite another when food shortages are the result of the deliberate use of food to produce fuel for our large cars and SUVs. The much higher prices for food affects everyone, but especially those on lower incomes. People in the developing world, many of whom live on extremely low incomes, um, have to compete for their daily subsistence in a world where food prices have risen. So this is a debate we're hearing a lot more about. The amount of grain that it takes to produce 75 liters uh, of fuel, which is about enough to fill your tank one time, is the same that it takes to feed one person a 2,000 calorie per day diet for one year. So you only get one fuel tank out of all of the food that it takes to feed one person for one year. Uh, so it's, it's quite dramatic. Uh, the United States now uses 40% of its massive corn crop to produce ethanol, and the U.S. corn crop is the biggest in the world. And along the bottom there you can see 40% of the corn crop. Uh, now I'd like to draw your attention to the second line. Notice in the last couple of years that uh, the U United States now uses more than 125 million tons of corn to produce ethanol. Now that's a lot of corn. Anybody know how much grain we, we produce in Canada? Canada is a big agricultural country, we all know that, we're big exporters, we're important. It's a huge country, second biggest in the world, a lot of very productive agricultural land. Anybody know? Well, <clears throat> if, you, if you take the crop, I don't have the latest figures for 2012, but for 2011, all the wheat, barley, and other grains grown in western Canada, plus all the corn and wheat grown in eastern Canada, all the cereals, in other words, grown in Canada, was 47 million tons. This is almost three times Canada's entire crop that they're using for ethanol. And we produce some ethanol as well. So I mean, this is really a massive amount. Um, on this slide, we can see the OECD pr projections for global ethanol production to 2019. Uh, the OECD pr projects growth in the industry of about 60% from now until 2019. The main feedstocks will continue to be coarse grains, which are the blue color along the bottom, mainly corn, um, and sugar, which is the yellow one, which is mainly Brazil. Uh, the small but uh, growing orange bars, which are the second from the top there, are, uh, uh, indicate the OECD's projection of slowly increasing production of ethanol from cellulosic sources which has been called second generation ethanol. I'll talk more about uh, second generation ethanol in a few minutes. But you can see that orange going up as the second from the top there. But as of 2012, there's, there's really nothing yet. But it starts, they're thinking it will start soon. Um, this is the OECD proje projection of global biodiesel production until 2019. They project a doubling of biodiesel production from 2010 to 2019, most of which will continue to be made from vegetable oils, which is the green color, which means canola oil or soybean oil, um, some palm oil. Um, and again, the, in this case, it's the little blue dots at the top are their projection of second generation biodiesel from biomass. And again, they're not projecting any amount really until late in this decade. Now there's been a lot of discussion about using residues and non-food or non-feed energy crops as feedstocks to produce biofuels. And biofuels made from cellulosic feedstocks are called second generation biofuels. And, and uh, the reason that there's so much interest because we can use uh, residues like corn stover uh, to produce ethanol or straw, you know, wheat straw, or barley straw, anything, we can produce ethanol out of it, or even uh, wood chips, 
or tall growing grasses like switchgrass. You hear a lot about switchgrass because it, around the world you can grow this crop, uh, it's a bulky crop, and you can get a lot of uh, biomass from it. Uh, or miscanthus, another, another leafy crop that grows a little bit better closer to the equator, but uh, again, produces a lot of bulk. Or even uh, shrub willows can be used to chop them up for cellulosic materials. Or hybrid poplars, uh, which uh, are now being farmed in some places where they grow very quickly. And so there's a perception that feedstocks for these second generation biofuels are abundant and diverse and they would be a good use of waste material. So there's been a lot of interest in it, and there's been a lot of research uh, being conducted on how to do this. And there's been a demonstration plant in Ottawa for several years where they've actually been using some processes to get ethanol uh, from these cellulosic materials. <clears throat> and also, um, research has shown that producing ethanol from cellulosic materials is much more energy efficient and radically reduces emissions of greenhouse gases. So getting uh, ethanol from cereals, you don't gain much energy uh, because it takes a lot of energy to grow the crops and produce the ethanol. Uh, there are various estimates, but uh, kind of a mean estimate is about 30% more energy from ethanol produced from corn. Uh, but 16 times uh, uh, 16 times the amount of en energy if you use, I spelled that wrong, it should be ligno, I don't know, like, lingo, ligno cellulose. Um, so I just noticed that this morning and I forgot to change it. Um, and you see, the process is quite complicated because you've got to start from these uh, food materials, these uh, stalks and stover, and convert it to starch and then to a sugar from which you can distill it and uh, get, get the alcohol. And the ethanol is about 99.98% uh, al pure alcohol. It's, it's whiskey. Uh, and um, they pour a little bit of gasoline into it. They call it denaturing it. So all the workers don't drink up the profits, I guess. Uh, but it's the same process. It's just a distillery process. But in order to get it from the straw stage, of course, it's much more complicated. The problem in producing ethanol from cellulosic biomass is that it's much more difficult and much more expensive. The logistics and costs of harvesting, collecting, storing, and distributing the huge quantity of bulky materials required to supply the feedstock requirements for a commercial ethanol plant throughout the year are the biggest obstacle. You can see there, a 100 million liter per year ethanol plant, which is not very big by today's standards, a 100 million liter plant would require 100 truckloads per day that's one every 15 minutes, each hauling 32 large round bales like that. You think of that? And that's 360. They've got to do it today. I mean, it has to come in today. The snowstorm doesn't matter. This has to go on all year round. And this is just for a 100 million liter plant. And, uh, you know, the distances these have to be hauled and stored and handled. Just getting trucks in and out of a, a yard, it just seems to me logistically almost impossible. To do, to do it uh, on small scale, yes, and they are. But commercially, in a big, in a big uh, way, I think, I, think uh, I, I don't see it happening. But with enough money, they can do it, perhaps. Um, so now let's briefly consider the reduction of greenhouse gases. This has been a major justification for stimulating growth of a biofuels industry. However, biofuel production generally requires the use and burning of fossil fuels, especially when you use cereal grains to produce the ethanol. Modern agricultural practices involve the use of fertilizers and pesticides. Both are heavily dependent on the use of fossil fuels in their production. Um, the tractors and trucks necessary to produce and transport the cereal grains uh, to the ethanol plant require fuel. And finally, the ethanol production process itself requires some method of heating usually use natural gas. Life cycle studies reveal that greenhouse gas reduction over the use of gasoline in vehicles uh, is in the order of 20 to 40 percent if you use corn to make ethanol. In other words, instead of using gasoline in your car using ethanol, uh, greenhouse gases are reduced by 20 to 40 percent. 
uh, depending on the process. But with cellulosic ethanol, much more, 70 to 90 percent, and biodiesel from canola, maybe by 50 percent. So the ethanol from corn or wheat, you gain a little bit in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, but not so much. Uh, now, while the reduction of greenhouse gases, of course, is an admirable objective and has been promoted highly, it seems that the production and use of biofuels to achieve this objective is very costly. Uh, studies have shown it costs several hundred dollars per ton of CO2 equivalent, as compared to only about $30 or so per ton by using the most efficient ways of reducing greenhouse gases. So, from an economics perspective, if, if the goal is really to reduce greenhouse gases, if this is what you're really trying to do, growing corn and making ethanol out of it is, is a, not a very good way. It's, it's, a, it's a very expensive way to reduce greenhouse gases. If you really want to reduce greenhouse gases, there are much cheaper ways of doing it than producing corn ethanol. And uh, while there is some reduction in greenhouse gases with the production of cereal-based biofuels, there are also a number of negative environmental consequences from producing them that are not just uh, greenhouse gases, really. The ethanol frenzy has provided an incentive for some marginal quality land to be shifted into crop production. Farmers tend to use more fertilizers and chemicals in their attempts to increase yields in response to the much higher prices for cereals and oil seeds. So this could lead to additional leaching of nutrients into the groundwater mm -hmm. and runoff into drainage systems. Increased intensity of crop production leads to more monoculture and increased soil erosion, not to mention the greater need for fossil fuels to power the more intense farming practices. Also, production of one liter of ethanol requires between four and eight liters of water, although the newer plants uh, uh, can get by with little less water. Um, the economic pressure to import biofuels, especially biodiesel from tropical countries, threatens the rainforests. Biodiesel plants have greatly increased their demand for palm oil. Logging and burning of some of the most biologically diverse, diverse forests in the world, in Indonesia and Malaysia, places like that, logging and burning of those forests that have been well underway for several years uh, to plant more palm trees so they can export the palm oil to Germany to make, to make um, biodiesel. So while there is some gain maybe in, and it's expensive, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas. There are a whole lot of other negative environmental consequences. As a result, um, uh, environmental lobby groups are not so enthusiastic about biofuels as they were, say, 10 years ago, because they recognize some of these other additional problems. <clears throat> now, many have claimed that the new jobs that biofuel plants bring to rural areas boost local employment and economic activity. but. Research has shown that only a small number of permanent jobs are created in the biofuel industry. In Iowa, a new 190 million liter plant added only 35 permanent workers. The plant in Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, 26 new jobs. Even this modest outcome is somewhat tempered since this is the gross gain in employment, not the net gain. The difference between the gross and the net is important. In response to higher uh, feed grain prices, the profitability and size of the livestock sector in Canada has been reduced. All kinds of pressure on the pig enterprise and on the cattle enterprise. And this has reduced um, the size of, uh, or it has the potential of reducing the size of the livestock industries. And therefore, reducing the livestock transportation and processing sectors. So, even though there are new jobs that you can easily count at the Lloyd Minster plant, it's what's harder to count is maybe some losses in uh, jobs other places. So for this reason, net gains in employment generally are much smaller than the gross gains. Prices for corn, barley, oat, oats, soybeans and wheat have greatly increased in 2007, 2008 and now again 2011, 2012. These have been exciting times for grain and oilseed producers, but the high crop prices have brought financial hardships to the beef and pork sectors that rely heavily on the availability of feed grains. The high grain prices have had huge financial impacts on the livestock sector in Canada, the United States, and really around the world. Because feed, of course, represents the largest cost in raising livestock. Despite the woes 
In the livestock sector, it's a reasonable question to ask if the higher grain and oil seed prices will lead to higher net farm incomes, as many believe. The short answer, unfortunately, no. What are important, again, are net incomes, not gross incomes. Net income is total gross income minus the total costs of production. Because of increased, uh, uh, because of increased prices of grains and oil seeds, prices have been rising for inputs necessary for crop production, such as fertilizer, equipment, and storage. Due to the competitive market structure of the grain and oil seed sector, higher commodity prices always result in higher prices for land. With little or no improvement Yeah, I forgot to do that. <laughs> With little or no improvement in the net returns to the owners of farmland. So gross income is not net income. Uh, and because of the competitive structure, the winners of the biofuel boom have been the owners of farmland. Because the extra profitability of grains gets capitalized into the prices of, of inputs. And uh, uh, although there's more, uh, farm tenants and workers receive little benefit, so farmers who rent the land don't get much benefit, but since many farmers also own land, they, they have gained through the appreciation in the value of their land. I still own my land in Saskatchewan. Actually, it's just being sold right now, but I have gained because the price of farmland has gone up due to the higher prices of, of grains. So farm tenants and workers have received little benefit, and new farmers, of course, are faced with much higher costs of entry due to the higher costs of land. So although there's more money coming into agriculture, not everyone gains, and the persistence of low net farm incomes will not be relieved. Land prices have been increasing rapidly in the United States in response to the higher commodity prices. Prior to 2006, no farmland in Iowa had ever sold for more than $3,000 an acre. It had always been just under $3,000. Then prices took off. In October 2006, some land sold for $3,800 an acre. Then February 12, 2007, uh, February 2007, uh, a 230-acre field in eastern Iowa was sold at an auction sale for a state record of $6,010 per acre, which made $1.38 million, uh, cracking a mark that has stood for only two weeks at $5,300 an acre. Um, now if we jump ahead for five, five years, five and a half years up to 2012, um, some land was sold for $16,000 an acre on October 20th, followed three days later by some land at 19,000 an acre, and two days later, $21,000 an acre. And you see, up until 2006, no land had ever been sold for more than three, it had, no, it had never reached 3,000. I have many colleagues at Iowa State University who have been watching the land market for years, and they always thought it was going to go up to 3,000, and now it's over 20,000. So you can see uh, that most of the benefit has gone into the land prices. So in conclusion, it is clear that biofuels have become a growth industry with rapid expansion of ethanol in the United States and Brazil and a quickening pace of biodiesel production in Western Europe. Governments have greatly assisted the growth of the biofuels industry. Policies have had the objective of increasing energy security, reducing greenhouse gases, increasing and stabilizing farm incomes, and promoting diversification and rural development. The main effects of these policies have been a small increase in energy security, but at high cost. A small reduction in greenhouse gases, also at a very high cost. Short run, but not long run, increases in net farm income. Grain and oil seed producers have gained, and livestock producers have lost. The principal gainers have been the farm land owners. And a small impact on rural div diversification. Some communities have gained, those that have got the, uh, the facilities close to their close to their home. Research aimed at reducing costs of production, especially from a second generation biofuel, offer probably the best hope of making biofuel production more competitive in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I love the PowerPoint and the pictures, and this one is the best one yet. I had to uh, save that for last. Very nice, very nice. It's very funny. Um, so now we know if you have land in Saskatchewan that you're selling, we know where to go for a home. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs>
Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions, and I would like, if you wouldn't mind, just briefly say who you are so that people can know uh, when you ask a question. Floor is open. Yes. My name is Knut Peterson. I missed the first part of your presentation, but uh, my question is basically uh, if, if government subsidies were withdrawn from the industry right now, would it be able to survive? Um, that's, that's an excellent question, actually, and, and the answer is yes. Um, once the plants are built, <clears throat> All they need to do is cover their variable costs of production. And the variable costs of production will change as the price of, of the feedstock goes up or down. So for example, uh, in the United States where the industry is a little bit older, there have been some ethanol plants that have gone bankrupt, at least, I know some, at least two times. And they're sold for 50 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on whatever it takes. But they continue to produce ethanol. And so as long as, as long as, uh, as they can cover their variable costs, they will continue to produce. A second reason is in the United States, uh, their Clean Air Act uh, requires some kind of an additive to the gasoline. They're now have, they're using ethanol for that. And uh, a minimum octane content for gasoline in the United States is 87. The, ethan uh, the, the octane content of ethanol is um, something higher than 87, I think 89 or something like that. So what they've done in their uh, uh, gasoline refining, uh, uh, the, the refineries, is they've lowered the ethanol, sorry, they've lowered the octane level of gasoline to something like 85 point something, 85 and a half or something. So they mix it with the ethanol to bring it up to 87. So now, uh, if all of a sudden ethanol was no longer available, now the United States is in trouble on two parts. One is how to meet the clean air standard. And secondly, they'd have to rejig all the refineries to bring the octane level up. So I think there's no doubt that it will continue. Uh, uh, it may not expand beyond this, but the, energy, uh, the United States Energy Security and Independence Act that was passed in 2007 uh, when George Bush uh, signed it, uh, is requiring ethanol production to increase about three times from its present level by 2022. So now they're hoping that most of this increase will be from the second generation ethanols. But as I stated, uh, I think that's highly unlikely. I think they will have to change that. I don't think they can go much further uh, politically or economically. You know, they owe a lot of money in the United States and, and this is costly. No effect so far. Um, uh, ethanol has an energy content of about two thirds of gasoline. So uh, in, a, in our gasoline here, we have 5% generally ethanol. Um, we have flex fuel vehicles. Sometimes you rent a flex fuel. It can go up to 85% ethanol. It, cars in Brazil are engineered, so they can go from zero to 100%. We, we can't do that in our cars, but they can there. Um, but people tell me that with 5% ethanol in their tanks, uh, uh, in the mixture, people can't tell the difference in their gas mileage. But when you get up to about 15% ethanol, people notice that they've got to fill up their tank more often. And if you had 100% ethanol, presumably you could only go two-thirds the number of kilometers, you see. So uh, uh, the ga uh, ethanol has been priced very close to its energy content. But we, we don't know the exact price because it's private. It's not, we don't have a, a series of that data. But in the United States, they do. And uh, it's, ethanol has been priced at about 70 to 72 percent of gasoline price, a wholesale price of gasoline, a little higher than the 67 percent energy content because there's been a, a pull, a demand for this because they have to meet the uh, the minimum content for their, uh, for their Clean Air Act. But once they get above what they need for that, the thinking is that it will settle in at about its equivalent energy content, which would be about two-thirds of the price of gasoline.
I try to prepare my lecture so that the subtle underlying message comes through and you realize it later. Uh, I don't know if that will happen. Um, subliminal. Yeah, subliminal. That's the word I was looking for. Um, the message in my talk and my work with Danny is that um, I believe there would have been no first generation ethanol industry without obviously a lot of government assistance. If you think the government assistance in Canada is high, you should see what it was in the United States, much higher. Um, and the reason that there was so much government assistance was lobbying by the Corn Producers Association and the American Farm Bureau. These are the winners after all, the growers of, of corn. And there's been very effective lobbying throughout uh, uh, the US Congress for these kind of policies. And also in Canada, we've had the Canola Council of Canada, the Barley Grower, the Wheat Growers Association. They're all lobbying hard for this. Um, the cattle producers are not as effective to lobby against it. Uh, they haven't really, they missed an opportunity, I think, to uh, counter the claims of the grains industry. And so we've got this first generation industry, I believe, because of the effective lobbying of the grain producers, primarily the corn producers. Now, although um, I've shown many ways that the second generation could, could develop, more expensively, of course, but there is no association of straw producers or corn stover producers or wood chip producers. There's no, uh, there's no association of manure producers for uh, lobbying to get help for the biogas. Although I think the biogas is the one that is closest to being economically efficient on its own. And I think it has real potential because it does use waste materials and it does produce electricity. The problem we've got with that is, the main problem is, you know, we've got monopolies on the buying side, or monopsonies, uh, buying the electricity and how to hook up the, it's, it's like the wind farms and the solar panels, it's, it's a complicated and expensive process and the existing Transelta utilities and, and the big uh, electrical companies already have their sources of power. They don't need this. So this is the biggest problem. But I think the, the waste materials, anaerobic digestion for biogas, that makes a lot of sense. And the studies that Danny and I have done on this look, look, show that it's, it, it's pretty close to being profitable on its own. But corn-based ethanol or wheat or second generation or even the biodiesel, um, they're they never would have happened, I think, without a lot of government assistance. Yeah, uh, I, I have not come across that, but uh, I can certainly understand because, yes, with the higher grain prices, they're putting on a lot more fertilizer, pesticides, different things, and cropping, uh, uh, and the yields are way up in the United States. Uh, the, um, can we call them apologists, uh, but promoters of the biofuels industry. If you look at the Renewable Fuels Association web pages and so on, they have a lot of, um, a lot of arguments why this has been good. And, and they say that uh, the actual, when I put up this 40% corn, they say most of the extra corn has been produced, most of the corn that's being used now is extra. Uh, in other words, the amount that's available for food and feed uses is almost the same as it was before. And the reason is because they're converting lands for other things into corn production and putting on a lot more inputs to get it. So I'm not surprised to hear a lot of runoff down the Mississippi River. Yeah. But I think you're getting at uh, the level of self-sufficiency in Canada. Yes, States, comparing yeah. two countries. Yeah. We're, we're both big net exporters. I mean, we export uh, uh, about half of our production. And the United States also is, a, is the largest exporter in the world. So it really doesn't affect um, the consumption here uh, in Canada or in the United States. But what it does affect is the price. It affects the price because it's a world market for these commodities. And so is the price of wheat, like the price of wheat is now, is, uh, anybody know what the, it's, uh, it's $300 a ton and was around, it was less than $200 a ton a couple of years ago. And so this reflects the world price, and corn also, and canola, all of these are way up. So now in Canada, uh, we don't notice it so much, because first of all, we're rich compared to the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world. And the food that we buy when we go to Safeway, depending on the product, only about 25% of it 
uh, 25, if we pay a dollar, about 25 cents goes to the farmer. But on the green crops, uh, like if you buy a loaf of bread, it's more like six or seven or eight cents goes to the farmer out of every dollar that you spend. So if the wheat price you know, doubles, it doesn't change the price of bread by that much. But if you're living in uh, Tanzania or, uh, or you know, Sri Lanka, now if the price of corn or rice goes up, I mean, you notice that pretty quickly. Also, you must realize that uh, in Canada, we spend only about uh, less than 12% of our disposable income on food, about 8% food in the home and 4% in restaurants. Now, this is the second lowest in the world. Only the United States spends less on food than we do. Many countries spend 20, 30 percent, and poorer countries 30, 40, even up to 50 percent. But even within Canada, every country, the poorest people spend the most. You take somebody rich like Professor uh, <laughs> 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 Professor Wei Shu, <laughs> or Danny Leroy, heads of departments, <laughs> you know, um, they're probably <laughs> way below 12 percent. <laughs> <laughs> they have to, to get up to the 12%, they have to buy extra beer. Uh, uh, but you take uh, a single mother with two small children at home, now, uh, now you're talking, every time the price of food goes up, it affects her a lot. And of course, the poorer the country, the poorer the situation. And the more the food price rises, affect them. Why do you think that was? There was actually, there was quite a movement um, in the United States, uh, particularly among the Democrats uh, coming up to the election, to relax the, um, what do they call it down here? It's uh, uh, the, the standard the, for the clean, clean fuel standard. Uh, and it's quite complicated. And, and a number of my colleagues at Purdue University in Iowa State and Illinois uh, did studies on this that showed that if they were to relax that standard for one year or two years, you know, they did 5%, 10% or something, so they, uh, they didn't meet the standard of the Clean Fuel Act um, for a couple of years, what effect that might have on prices. And, of course, this was funded by uh, renewable fuel standards, but uh, uh, I think there's, their study looked reasonable to me, uh, a couple of studies that I saw. It would, it would have reduced the prices a little bit, but, of course, the corn producers didn't want that, and, and in, in the end, uh, uh, um, the EPA did not allow this. Uh, and their, one of their arguments was it wouldn't really make that much difference. Because the amount that they were talking about relaxing was only somewhat marginal, like 5% or 10%. Okay. If we go to a second drought this coming year. Yeah. We're well, going to be down to 65 days of. Yeah. yeah. That probably won't be efficient. Uh, sufficient to make them move? Well, as I mentioned before, I think, I think the amount of ethanol production is not going to decrease appreciably, uh, no matter what happens. I think we're locked into a kind of a minimum now, and uh, we just have to go beyond that. And, and the question is, well, it's already happening. Um, these biofuel plants are not very profitable, even on their own. Uh, on, on, uh, when corn prices go up. So uh, if oil prices were to go to you know, 150 or 200, you'd see a whole bunch of new ethanol plants, I think. But as it is, I think they're in a holding pattern and there hasn't been much new construction for a couple of years. But they're not going away. Seeing more hands, so I guess I'll ask a question. What, what I find quite interesting about this, well, a number of things are quite interesting, but one is the way um, if you shift um, the government policy in some ways because there's something happening that they think will be a populist notion of reducing greenhouse emissions and um, protecting the environment, that it can unbalance a whole system of yeah. uh, food and, and energy production and, in fact, the balance between what we call more developed countries and less yeah. developed countries. It really is a kind of a world system. It is, and, through that way. and especially with food way. products. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But and it's also interesting how, in a very short time, it's almost as someone holds up a flag and they say, "Reduce greenhouse emissions." Yeah. Everybody goes to the, that yeah. side of the boat, 
and it can have very negative consequences, I think, as you're showing. When this started, really the big promoters, uh, well, corn producers, yes, but also the environmental lobby groups are quite behind this mm -hmm. uh, because of the greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, not thinking through the process. I mean, to get corn, you need to put on fertilizer, you need a tractor fuel, you need heating, and so on. Um, and by the time um, the ethanol started to pick up, the lobby groups were almost silent on this because some were still promoting this and some were against it. They couldn't really figure out, I think, which way to go. But now they're pretty solidly against it. And uh, interestingly, politically too, you know, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada was generally against government assistance, but they're the ones who did this when they got into power. Um, because again, uh, you know, there was a lot of, pr there was nobody against it. Everybody thought it's a good idea, as, as these editorials showed. Mm -hmm. But I, th I don't know if it would have been done again, but uh, certainly we're, we've got into this now. That's interesting. Um, other questions you wish to ask, please? Jim, I think, uh, I don't know what Ken thinks about this, but. Cattlemen tend to be cowboys, and almost no two agree with each other. <laughs> but you've got various segments. You've got the feeding sector, you've got the cow-calf sector, you've got the backgrounding sector, and you don't have, um, you don't really have much research going on into impacts. Uh, the, the, dairy, uh, the dairy and the poultry, which are also affected, they're supply controlled. So there's just a formula. Feed price goes up, their product price, the milk price goes up but not so with beef and pork. And I don't think those sectors had any idea what might happen to the feed prices. Uh, I think in all of a sudden, the, I mean, they were dealing with BSE. They were dealing with uh, uh, appreciation of the Canadian dollar. Uh, it was $1.57 uh, Canadian to $1 US uh, only about uh, six, eight or nine years ago, and all of a sudden, Canadian dollar is worth more than the United States dollar. And so these big issues, I think, swamped their thinking. Uh, and all of a sudden came these high feed prices, and it was too late to do anything. And, but, but generally, I don't think they are very effective lobbyists, like, like, the, like the grain producers and the oil seed producers, generally. Some of my students now, you know, they take a look at these grain prices and they're rubbing their hands, you know, they can't wait to get back and get in the family farm. Um, but, you know, China, I mean, it's a completely different situation, of course, where you don't, you have problems with land tenure and very tiny properties. But uh, certainly uh, there are many other effects on food prices. One of them is the growing incomes of countries like China. So it's, it's, it's pulling on the demand side. And, and what we're seeing is uh, uh, as, as, as countries get beyond $2 per day per capita income, at $1.25 one, at one per day, that's about $400 uh, per year per capita income, uh, people can, on average, get enough calories to eat. But it's not that nutritious, but they can get enough calories. At $2 per day, they can start to get a, a more of a balanced diet. But between $2 and $10 a day, which is Per capita income from about 750 to uh, you know, 3,500. Uh, then they start to decrease their uh, amount of uh, cereals in their diet, increase meats, increase uh, fruits and vegetables. And the projection is by 2050, we'll have two billion more people, and we need 70 percent increase in food production around the world. Um, uh, more, a higher percentage on the meat than on the cereals, because of the because of the increased incomes in countries like China, India, Brazil, Russia, and, and Indonesia, and others, and, and the high population growth rates there, uh, uh, sorry, high populations, not growth rates in China, but uh, so we need 70% more food. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, agriculture is really a key industry for the future because we cannot any longer expand our area. That's gone. Um, 
we're somewhat limited in our um, uh, technological developments. Uh, we seem to be somewhat blocked in our use of biotechnology. Uh, but I think we, we need to go in some direction because all of these increases must come from new technology in order to feed the extra two billion people. And the billion right now who are you know, malnourished. malnourished.